Well, hey, everyone, this is Heidi St. John. I hope you guys are having a wonderful morning or afternoon wherever you are. And I want to just invite you today to listen to part two of my interview with my friend, Sherry Seligson. Sherry has her master's degree in education, but more than that, she is a homeschool mom of four grown children, and she's a grandmother now, and she has a love for explaining science through the lens of scripture. Stick around. I think you're going to be encouraged. Well, for those of you who heard part one yesterday, part two, I think, is even more uh, informative and encouraging even than part one was. Today, Sherry and I are going to jump into the topic of evolution. Most of our students now that are coming out of the public schools for sure and out of our public universities don't have a handle, particularly Christian kids, don't have a handle on why and how they can defend their faith in the public square. And Sherry's going to tackle that topic with grace. The scriptures can stand up under the scrutiny of science. This is why I love the ministry of Answers in Genesis and why I'm thrilled to be keynoting there again this year for their Answers for Women conference. The Bible can be trusted. God's word can be trusted. And he reveals himself in scripture, as Sherry said so beautifully yesterday. And so buckle up today. We're going to have a wonderful conversation. Here's part two of my interview with my friend, Sherry Seligson. Um, placement so that we can see the heavens and give God glory. Which again, lines up with what the Bible tells us about God's heart for his creation, for his special creation, which is mankind. And we are different than the animals. There's another really interesting uh, thing I heard about on the news this morning. And I'm a, I, I love to listen to podcasts in the morning and I tend to, you know, jump around uh, from different thought thought leaders. And I was listening this morning to uh, another guy and he was talking about in New York, they have just mm-hmm. legalized composting of human beings, right? So, I, I read, I read that. Amazing. It's amazing. So, <laughs> so they, amazing. so, you, you know, grandma, grandma dies. And if she thought, Hey, yeah, that's cool. I don't mind being compost. Then you put her in a box and you surround her with, you know, lettuce and biodegradable things And in two months or so, she turns into dirt and then you take grandma out and you put her in the garden or whatever it is you're going to do with grandma. Yeah. And the conversation was, uh, is it wrong? Is it wrong to do this? And the the guest that was on the show this morning said he believes it is wrong because we are made in the image of God. We are not like the animals. We're not meant to be, you know, uh, I mean, the Bible records, yes, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, right? But he's, but but we are different than the animals. You don't just discard a human being. You don't treat a human yeah. being uh, in a way that that disregards the sacred nature of right. of the creation. Because God said we are made, we are image bearers yeah. of the living God, and that really does set us apart. And you can see how far the culture is moving when we just go, oh no, you know, uh, you know, Aunt Jane died, and so now Aunt Jane's, uh, we're gonna we're gonna on purpose turn you into compost, and on purpose. Uh, you know, put you in a bag and fertilize the garden with you. It seems that we, the farther we move away from the acknowledgement of God in every aspect of creation, the more chaotic the creation becomes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Without God, there is no order. And that's where that the chaos comes from, lack of him. And, and again, appreciating and respecting the human body as God's image, as you know, a human being as an image bearer. Um, we've lost that appreciation. And mm. Yeah, I don't know all the details. I know that the main purpose behind it is climate change, to be green. And you know yeah. what? <laughs> we can, well, this is the sidetrack, but you know, they say that really tall people have a bigger carbon footprint than really short people. So well, then we hey. should just get rid of them. <laughs> I mean, how far do we want to take this? That's a lot of compost right there. That's, I mean, you know, right. tall Seriously. people make a lot more compost lot than more, short people too. I that's mean, that's right. And think about the carbon emissions from them decomposing. So yeah, yeah I, I mean, right. It's just, it's just how far do you go? And in the, it, before you become absurd and granted, there are a lot of areas where we are already in the, in the absurd, but sure. Um, I, I just, I think that the biblical principles of appreciating the uniqueness of, of who we are, who, we, you know, every human being is valuable. Every human being is specially made. Um, God wants all, he doesn't want anyone to be lost. He, he wants all of us. I mean, it, so he, he pursues us. He's, he loves us. And so to, to diminish that is, um, it's a travesty to me. It's really sad. It is. What yeah. do you say 
to, there's a huge move in the culture right now. And I know a lot of people listening to the show are part of this movement that believe in theistic evolution. In other words, uh, these are the people that are like, nope, um, the Darwin was right. We just think it was a creator that made the primordial ooze. You know, God, God was the one who gave the original building blocks, but then the earth evolved as Darwin said that it did. Is there really scientific evidence for evolution? You know, um, there's interestingly not much. And when you look through the history of the definition of evolution, you'll see it changes pretty regularly because yeah. as new discoveries come up, oh, well, we got to tweak it to make it fit. Yeah, this. that didn't it, work. That doesn't yeah, fit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And even the mechanisms of evolution, there's punctuated equilibrium. There's all kinds of things, you know, disaster. And they have to always have the disasters happening because some, for transitions to happen. But, you know, it's, it's interesting. There's, there's very little there. First of all, first and foremost, I think that theistic evolution where God uses evolution to, to create diminishes his power. Mm. You know, when God spoke it into being boom, and it was, and he said, let there be light, boom, let there be animals according to their kind, boom, that's God's power, the power of his word. And so to say, let there be animals according to their kind, millions of years happening. And there's just, it, it doesn't even make sense to me right. um, to, to even think that. So in my opinion, most people, this comes from the lack of understanding of science, a fear of science in the Christian community. And so, and students are doing this today. They, they get very little education on creation based science in the church or even in private so schools, true. even in yeah. private schools. And so they hear all this stuff from secular science, they hear church, they read their Bibles, and they've got to fit the two of them together. And that's the best fit between the two. And it's wrong. So just a couple of examples. Um, some of the, the transitions, evolutionary mechanisms that are, are caused, things change, macro evolution, things change from one kind of animal to another, supposedly through mutations, changes in our DNA code. And 99.99% of our mutations observed, science observed, are negative or deadly. We rarely see something positive. When we do see something positive, it's usually because of a negative thing. So one of the biggest evolution in action examples are um, super bacteria. Okay, most people know what super bacteria are. They're bacteria that are really hard to get rid of if you get sick with them. And people are, can die from these, these infections from these guys. Super bacteria. They're are antibiotic resistant, right? That's the one like super resistant. bugs, the ones that we hear about. Yes. 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 So they, 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 they do not respond well to antibiotics. Okay. The reason is this super bacteria have a change in their cell wall, which is like the, the gatekeeper to get in and out of the cell that will not allow the antibiotics to get in to kill the organism. Okay. Which is why they're resistant. But because, but also because it's not allowing the antibiotics to get in, it doesn't allow nutrients exchange and waste exchange very well. So it's kind of like clogging up the pathways. And so super bacteria end up being larger than the wild type bacteria that exist. They can't eat very well. They can't, they can't compete in an environment with regular bacteria. And so they usually die out when there's a lot of other bacteria around in the environment. And so it's a negative change. They're only, it only showcases itself as being super, meaning they're resistant to something, but it's because of a negative change. It is not evolution. Evolution says that there needs to be more information, more positive information in the, in the transition from one organism to another of, a, of its kind. And so that's not it. That's not happening. Evolution in action has not been observed yet. Now we've seen slight changes in a, in a DNA code from one, one within a kind of an organism. Think about dog breeding. You've got your little teeny chihuahuas and your gigantic Great Danes and St. Bernards, and some of them are hairy and some of them are, can't handle this or can't handle that because they've been bred based on the traits we want them to have to benefit man, you know, whether they're cuteness traits or kindness traits or whatever traits, you know, um, and yet it's within the kind. So think of, I think of all the animals on the ark um, that God preserved uh, during Noah's time as being mutts. They have this range of ability to change and adapt to changing environments, whether it's colder or hotter or more sun or, you know, needing to be more aggressive or not. And so based on those changes that they're experiencing, the ones that can handle the extra cold or whatever um, will survive longer and pass the extra furry genes onto the next 
generation. But in all of the history of reproducing dogs and changing, you know, going through that, that, the, the realm of changes within their genetic code, they're still dogs. They're still the dog kind. They may have bred, been bred so far apart, they can't even breed together anymore. You know, imagine the poor Chihuahua and the Great Dane. You don't want to make right, right. No, that's just ooh. Let's let's, let's just <laughs> poke out our mind's eye right See? now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So so, <laughs> but they're still dog kind. They're still yes. dog kind. You don't get a dog with wings or a dog with, I mean, longer legs. You, longer legs where it's like a horse. It doesn't change kinds. And so, and yet, those kinds of changes within the dog kind or within you know. Moth, one of the classic examples is light colored moths to dark colored moths during the industrial revolution. That's adaptation. That's small changes with, that already existed. Genetic code that God put in all these mutt animals so they can survive the changes in our fallen world. It's not even the transition of, I'm sure most everyone's seen Archaeopteryx, which is the bird transition from, um, or transition from bird, reptile to bird. And it's this <laughs> smash looking crazy bird that, that, um, looks like it's kind of sort of bird and kind of sort of reptile. Right. It's bird. When you look at all the features of it, it's bird. And so my example for that is if you'd never seen in your life an ostrich, an ostrich is a bird. Everybody knows an ostrich is a bird. Nobody disagrees with me on that one, right? No scientists disagree with us on that. That, that we know of. Well, that we know of. Okay. Someone will come out, I'm <laughs> sure, and write you and say, hey, someone's going to write me. Yeah. <laughs> you wrong. <laughs> <laughs> They're classified, as far as I know, still as being bird. And so if you'd never seen one in your life and you saw the bones of a dead ostrich, actually, if you saw a live ostrich, they don't look very bird-like. They can't fly. Their neck's all scaly looking and reptile looking. They're pretty creepy looking animals if mm-hmm. you'd never seen one before. And so that's really what we're doing. We're looking at a crazy bird that's been preserved that's called Archaeopteryx. And it's a bird. It is not a transition. And that's the case with most transitions. Actually, all the transitions I've seen that have been purported to be a transition between one kind of organism to another. What we're seeing is it's more of one kind than the other. So it's within that, that side of that kind, and it's not in between the two. We're not seeing them. We're just not seeing them. That is why it's so, uh, uh, have you, you've been to the Ark Encounter? I have not yet. Oh my no. goodness. Oh, Sherry, you gotta go. Because they focus so much on teaching about animal kinds in the ark because it it explains how he would have gotten the animals right. onto the ark, right? That's right? And so they go into great detail talking about kinds and why it's so important that we don't adopt this modern language that strips these terms from the discussion, right? Because once right. you strip them from the discussion, it's like it's like trying to change pronouns. And and so now we're trying to change our pronouns. And so a young boy thinks that if he just takes a certain medicine, his chromosomes are going to go from, you know, uh, XY to XX, right? I'm so sorry. His chromosomes are all the same. Chromosomes yeah. do not change. Yeah. And the uh, the science behind them, this observable, we know these things to be true, but the language matters. And so teaching about kinds is very, very important. It's central yes. to understanding why the evolutionary theory just doesn't hold any water. Right. Uh, and I so appreciate you you touching on it today because the church has got to do a better job of addressing these issues. So I've got in the few minutes that we've got left, sure, I really want to talk to parents for a minute because I think it's easy to get lazy. Oh. Um, I was talking to a, a really good friend of mine this morning on the phone and just telling her, look, I have seven children. Our oldest is in her 30s now. Our youngest is 12. And it was, you know, 25 years ago when I was a younger mother. It was, you know, easy thing to start. You know, anyone can start strong. You know, it's hard. It's hard to finish strong. Yes. You can get tired. You just go, you know what? I've already, I did this with the five other kids. I'm sorry, but the, these last two of my seven, you guys, we're just not going to do math because I'm tired of it. You know, or we're just, you, you know, really don't mama, like math. Yeah, I really don't like math. I mean, I like it. I like it to a point. Like, okay. I like it when I get paid. Okay. I like it then. But I... I think that we've gotten lazy. I mean, at the risk of offending someone, I would say, I think that we've gotten lazy in our parenting and we don't want to exercise our muscle in the, which, which is our brain, right? We don't want to exercise our brain. And so it's much easier just to scroll Facebook or to let other people do uh, the discussions. But parents 
need to be helping their children reconcile what's being taught in the world with what the Bible says is true. Right. I mean, we otherwise our kids believe maybe, maybe my mom and dad don't actually believe this because they can't defend it. So what can parents do to help this process along while their kids are still home and they have the opportunity to influence them? I, I mean, again, we get weary. I get it. I mean, yeah. We, I mean, it, I'm tired. I'm not going to lie. Uh, me too. I mean, yeah, me too. I had four and, and, and they all came yeah. in six years. I had this big mob of kids and like, wow. Yeah. So I get it. Yeah. And yet, it's so important because our worldview affects everything yes. and it's being attacked. And so when, when we as parents know our kids are being attacked, mama bear comes out, right? We, we were like, yeah. I'm going to protect my kids. And we have to look at it like that. And grant, and thankfully there's a lot of resources available to you. You don't have to understand yes. all of this stuff. Yeah. You don't, you yeah. just have to be encouraged to know that it can be explained and it, you don't have to know it. Someone else can help encourage you. And, and so, you know, the answers in Genesis, there's a lot of great organizations out there, creation organiz- organizations that are doing hard science and doing yeah. research and interpreting it with a creation worldview. And so look for those, those, those sites that they have. They, they put out articles. I mean, there's Creation Ministries International, Institute for Creation Research. Um, Apology Educational Ministries is the company that I work for. We, we produce for homeschoolers curriculum. And there's other great creation-based science curricula out there. I'm not saying you got to pick one, pick the one that works for you, yeah. but there's a lot available and, um, you know, have people come into your church and speak to your teens and have the parents come too, because the parents need to hear it as well. Um, because they, they need to be, they need to be exposed to this, to know at least that there's people out there who can explain all this technical stuff in a way that's understandable and that we don't have to, to be afraid yeah. of, of this onslaught. And it truly is an onslaught because it's, you, you become belittled and unintelligent by them. If you say, well, I believe God made everything. Well, then they gaslight you yeah. and they're like, no, you're the idiot, yeah. right? You're, you're, you're stating an objective truth. Like, right. you know, the simplest one I could think of in the culture right now is the the obvious insanity and stupidity and wickedness of denying basic DNA, right? So now we're Breaks denying basic DNA. And when a, when a young person stands up and says, no, you're born a girl or a boy, then they instantly label you. They sort of gaslight you, try to make you feel like you're the idiot. Yeah. And our kids need to know that their faith can stand up to scrutiny. That's right. And I think that is the message. I mean, that's what I've been watching you do now for all the years that uh, that I've done. We were just talking before the show. You you met me, I think, when my 12-year-old was a baby. Yes, you just uh, had her. Little Taylor. Good yeah. grief. Oh, my goodness, yeah. Sherry. When did we get old? When did we become grandparents? Well, like I, said, I, don't know. We, I know. It's crazy. Oh, it's crazy. Oh, my goodness. Oh, we need to go sit down, watch a sunset. We'll feel better. Let's do that. Yes. <laughs> we need a sunset. Really quick. We need a, we need a sunset. Stop. Let's go. <laughs> no, I mean, it's it's faith on both sides. Yes. And they need to understand that, that the person that might be gaslighting you, that calling you stupid, they have a faith too. They don't know that, but they have a, they have to believe in something. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I feel like this, I mean, it's a spiritual battle. And so yes. um, I've talked to many people who hold to evolution. I love to ask questions. I love to just help have a conversation with them and just hear what they're thinking and why they think that and, and ask hard questions. Ultimately, if they have a problem with what they're seeing with evolutionary theory, what will they believe? This, they'll have to bow the knee. I mean, this, this is, it's really a crisis of faith for them to come to terms with the truth, which we know as truth. And so they will fight tooth and nail to avoid having to face their God. I mean, again, mm-hmm. I believe it's, I believe it's a spiritual battle. And so, of course, we should be praying. We should be praying for our children, we praying for our families, we praying for our churches, but we can do things. We can, we can um, be proactive and have these conversations. I mean, there's just so much available. And um, your, your podcast is one that brings in people that just says, hey, what's going on here? And calls them out and says, let's talk about it. So yeah. um, we just need to be proactive and do that for the sake of our children. Um, for their souls, for, for their, for our generations after them. Yeah. Well, and you're, you're, you're absolutely correct in saying that this is a spiritual battle. And as I've been saying for, you know, decades now out on the speaker circuit, you can't fight a spiritual battle using a carnal weapon. 
uh, we fight using the weapons that we know come from God and are found in his word. And we know that truth, and we just talked about this uh, a couple of days ago with, with uh, Dr. Jeff Myers, truth is a person and his name is Jesus. And that is where truth begins. And that is where it is found. And uh, as parents, we've got to be uh, equipping our kids with the confidence to know that their faith can stand up in the public square, that it can stand up to scrutiny and they don't need to be gaslit in the public square because if we, if we can arm them with truth, if, we, if we're not afraid to study science from a biblical worldview, then our kids are going to get out into the culture. I mean, your kids have gone on. You've got a, a kid right now who's studying to be a flight surgeon, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's just yeah. going through medical school. He actually got his master's in engineering and he wants to do the flight surgeon and, and space force and blows my mind. This kid, I yeah. could, we could, that's a whole other conversation. This kid was in eighth grade. I'm thinking... I don't think he's college directed and, and <laughs> Lord just help me have, you know, you know, God just does things. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's really amazing. Well, the story of faithfulness, you know, to say, Lord, you know, it help me to teach my children to know who you are so that they can, at the end of the day, listen to and be guided by the voice of the Holy Spirit for themselves so that God will finish. And I think this is such an encouragement for homeschool moms because you homeschooled your kids, obviously, and I have homeschooled ours. And uh, moms need to know that God will finish in your children the work that he's begun in them through you. He honors faithfulness. You don't have to be, you know, a mom with a PhD and someone who, you know, is prof- prof- proficient in every subject that your kids are going to study. You have to be faithful. And that's what that's what God honors at the end of the day. It's faithfulness. Sherry, where can people find you online? Because you've got a great website and uh, you've written some wonderful books. And I think it's important. I know I mentioned at the at the uh, top of the show, but people are going to want to check out your books for Apologia. Because Apologia, probably one of the premier, I think, um, publishers of science curricula from a Christian worldview in the nation, bar mm-hmm. none. And uh, you've been writing for them for quite a while. Yeah, so they're Apologia Educational Ministries, so Apologia.com, um, and they've got kindergarten through AP level science classes, yeah, yeah. Um, and set so full year courses, and mom and dad don't have to know anything about science. We've got instructional videos, we've yep. got academy classes, there's a bunch available to help walk students through that from a biblical worldview. And um, I, I have a website, SherrySelligson.com, it's kind of a landing spot, you can con- connect with me there. Um, um, yeah, and they're going to see you at FPEA. I will be at this FPEA year. this year. Yes. And, um, I'll be doing some summit ministries, um, speaking and I'll be at teaching diligently a couple different places. So, so um, I'm going to see you out on the circuit. Yay. Good. I love that. That's great. And we get to do that. some traveling. Um, my God's been so gracious, you know, our kids are grown. Um, uh, so my husband and I, we will travel to film instructional video, uh, clips, when Y'all I, are so cute when you do it too. It's very cute. He's I my videographer say. now. Yes. It's just so fun. So <laughs> we'll go to a place. We pink, we, we, we were at all kinds of places this past year. Um, pink lakes and, you know, huge cliffs and just as long as you're not talk. jumping into those lakes with that funny film on them. Oh no. But everyone's no, no. like, stay out of that water. No, no, no. We're on that. No, but no, it's, no, we're not it's doing just that. really cool to bring <laughs> science to it's a life to students. I don't want to sit and watch a PowerPoint presentation as a kid. I can't imagine you know, kids want to do that. So we go to the places and we talk about geysers and we see a geyser. We go and look at whales and we talk about whales. And so were you just we, in Wyoming? We, the summer we did, we, we did a dinosaur yeah, dig recently. With, um, you were, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah was, we've done the dinosaur dig there. It's pretty cool. It's fascinating. There's yeah. so much creation there. So much to see from the, the global flood and, and it's just beautiful. It's hard to get to in the middle of nowhere, but have you done the uh, petrified forest yet? Yeah, there's two of them. There's one in Mississippi for those of you who don't know. Oh, and I've not been, I did not know that I've been to the other one. What's cool about it is they've, there are trees petrified there from multiple climates all in one spot. Interesting. How do well, we get there? my goodness. Can you imagine? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Nowhere well, does it say, but I'm like, wow, sounds like there'd be a flood from all over the world to get these. What trees I here. thought was so fascinating about the petrified forest. I mean, it's been years since I was there, but the signs that were saying they have to actively try to dispute the Bible. Right. So there was one, maybe you saw it. There was one big plaque that said, you know, uh, while uh, while many people observing this believe that it looks like floodwaters came through this area, 
scientists think blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, it was so obviously a flood, <laughs> you know, yes, but we, we're, we're so afraid of it that we have to put a big giant placard to say, I know that your eyes are telling you that this looks like a flood happened here, but that wasn't actually it. I'm like, man, you know, I, I, uh, that feels real sciencey to me. Well, and the more you read and the more you see those kinds of things, the more clues you're seeing that they're having to make it fit yes, to fit their worldview. It's not yep. fitting. And they're really scrambling. I mean, this micro understanding microbiology now and the, and the molecular biology and the reaches we've done, they're scrambling because molecular biology is showing creation. It is, it, it's, it's, it's really creating problems for them. And so they're scrambling with their terminology, with their explanations. It, it, it's, it actually is amazing. It, it's, well, yeah, it's, it's just really amazing that they would well, still hold you to it. Alluded again, to it earlier. They're it is. To it. And the Bible is true. And the Bible yes. declares that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's really what this is all about. That's what the study of science is about. It's about bringing glory and honor to God. That's why we teach our children so that they will bring glory and honor to God. Right. And uh, it's why I love the the work that you have been doing these many years, my friend. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for a wonderful conversation, for uh, bringing some insight and some encouragement to parents who are in the trenches to let them know. And for the teens that are listening, to let them know your faith can stand up to the scrutiny of modern science. And it's just so encouraging. So thank you for taking time with me today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for having me and thank you for doing what you do. So uh, you're a wonderful, clear voice in the midst of craziness. It is crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. <laughs> it's, cra it's crazy out there. Sherry Seligson, you're a treasure. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks. For more information on Sherry Seligson, you can go to HeidiStJohn.com. Just click on the podcast and scroll down to the show notes every single day. I link back to the resources from the wonderful guests that we have here at the show. If you guys have guest ideas for me, you can shoot them to me at HeidiStJohn.com forward slash mailbox Monday. That's also where you can leave your questions, including questions for Dr. Mark Sherwood. And we love to hear from you. Love to hear your feedback. Thank you guys for leaving reviews for the podcast. We just passed 7 million downloads and we appreciate you guys sharing the word about this podcast wherever podcasts are available. Have a great day, everybody. Love your families well. And I will see you back here again at the intersection of faith and culture.